Okay, hi guys, my name is Shannon Beveridge. I am the host of X's and O's, a podcast where we talk about queer relationships and sex. How exciting, everyone loves those things, right? I do, okay. I have a very special guest with me. Her name is Rebecca Black. She is a pop star and an OG YouTuber who I've known since 2017, which is crazy because I'm not sure anyone even knows we know each other, but we are in fact friends. We're besties, as besties. you just said. Yes, we are besties. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about queer stuff, which mm-hmm. should be exciting. And Rebecca is queer, if you didn't know. Welcome to 2023. Thanks for having me, Shan. Anytime. This is my first podcast guest, so pretty exciting stuff. It's an honor. It's an honor. I love to be a first guest. Me and Rebecca met in 2017. We were on a little tour called Love is Love, but at the time, Rebecca was straight. I was straight. (laughs) Imagine that. Yeah. That was quite the tour, quite the experience. (sighs) Yeah, we were strangers. We were strangers. We all were strangers, I guess. Kind of. I guess I knew Miles at the time. You lived with him. Yeah, so I did know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we actually knew each other quite well. <laughs> that was such an intense tour. I don't know if anyone listening went, but it was so intense, the meet and greets that we would have. Yeah. Very, very emotionally charged situations going on. Totally. I mean, it makes sense. It's like a place for queer and gay acceptance and... Especially when we went to cities like like Indianapolis. Oh my gosh. I felt like I was watching you guys, like both you and Miles. I mean, it's, it was actually really impressive and incredible the way that you could be so personal and like take that much That's emotional so nice. bearing because it's a lot. I yeah. mean, obviously it's so important like for everyone who was there. Can we talk about how you were straight? Do you feel like that tour affected your sexuality in made some way? Shape, or- <laughs> yeah. Made me gay. Do you think? No, no. But I do think... I think becoming friends with you and also like the relationship that I had after that, I was finally around like gay people for Mm -hmm. the first time in my life. I always had like queer friends, but I was never surrounded like by a predominantly queer community. And that was life changing. Yeah. I was like, oh, being in like a predominantly queer community surrounded by people that like I would soon come to understand that I am attracted to. (laughs) was eye-opening for sure it wasn't that long after that tour though that you were like kind of like fully coming out I feel in in my personal life life. yeah yeah I mean I basically got into a relationship and then and then obviously like as that kind of came to an end like I was friends with you I was friends with all of these queer people and like going it was the first time I was really introduced to like going out in a gay way way. (laughs) like going out in a queer zine and if I look at people that I have dated yeah after like knowing you (laughs) (laughs) oh my god it's different I mean, I really, this was like all a couple years before I came out, but I had like gay puberty that summer. Like I went to Pride for the first time. I was hooking up with girls. I was like watching from the sidelines. Like what did I do to her? Yeah. What happened? Something irreversible. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We opened the floodgates and it was like, Rebecca is queer as fuck. But then looking back, like it became so evident. And there's even still moments now where I'll like think back to like a friend of mine from middle school or elementary school and be like, Oh, it was always there. It was al- obvious. Yes, it was Obviously. always there. I just, I never knew. Okay, did you ever like officially come out? Because I, I do feel like it's interesting that there are a lot of people that I talk to that don't, that don't know, know you're gay. It really depends on where, like, where are you living online? Yeah, because so I did. True. I never really came out on my own. If it makes sense, I kind of came out on a podcast. I. Didn't even know it was going to happen. And I had just broken up with my ex. I forget who used a pronoun, but someone used a pronoun. Mm. And I was kind of at that point where already I was starting to feel like, I need to mention this maybe Mm -hmm. at some point because the music I was writing was about her and it was becoming like a very big part of my, I don't know, musical identity. I was kind of in a transitional period. And so I never really like made a decision. I just... Like organically. Yeah. And and some people consider that as like, okay, you came out Mm -hmm. and I knew that would happen. But then I, I don't know. I just never... Took it back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. Well, speaking of music and exes, 
<laughs> I feel like we share a very unique experience in that we've worked with exes yes. on projects, specifically yes. music videos. Period. And what's interesting is we have we're the opposite person in that experience. Yes. You are artist and I was director. director. What what was your experience like with that? I'm so grateful that I have dated creative people and I think a big reason I am drawn to people is because I love their creative vision Mm -hmm. and they're inspiring to me and the time that I did it with my ex we were dating at the time obviously obviously (laughs) it's not so obvious Rebecca because I wasn't I could not be more excited that the first sponsor of X's and O's is a queer founded and queer owned business Tomboy X if you don't know them Tomboy X creates sustainable size and gender inclusive underwear swimwear, and loungewear. They make everything from bikinis, briefs, boy shorts, compression tops, and underwear for tucking and packing. And they run from sizes 3XS to 6X, which is boss. This tank top I'm wearing today is from Tomboy X, and I love it because I don't have to wear a bra with it because it has built-in support, which is kind of the best thing in the whole entire world because I hate wearing bras, and it's cute. Supporting them helps support my podcast, so go to www.tomboyx.com slash Shannon for 20% off the entire website. It's obviously really difficult in a lot of ways because you become equally, I think, so attached to the thing you're creating. It doesn't become one person coming on to do my thing. Now it's like this thing that we are trying to create together. You, you like make a baby. Yes. Truly. You really do. And, and you're and- in love. Potentially. So yes. it's a love child. You care about it so much. I think you care maybe even a little bit more because obviously this is someone that like you really want them to be happy with it mm-hmm. and you want to make something that is like the best thing you've ever done. But then just like with a child, like you want to parent it differently. So maybe you have different creative decisions. And I've gotten in huge fights with exes just over like caring direction? so yeah. much. Yeah. And really the entirety of my career, like I'm an independent artist too. So Mm. I'm not only the artist, but I'm like essentially producing it. Money and finances and scheduling and logistics. Like it's very unsexy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But at the end of the day, like the projects that I have made with people I've dated are like my most proud and also some of the most fun. Yeah. Like I love to be directed. (laughs) (laughs) I have to imagine that's why in film, like, actors date directors or obviously actors date other actors. Like, working on something together and creating something with someone is, like... It's intimate, for sure. So vulnerable, so intimate. And, like, also, like, when you really love it, Mm -hmm. it's so fulfilling. Totally. My experience is a little (laughs) bit different. First of all, we were not together when I made the projects with my ex. So that was interesting. But at the same time, I was definitely probably still in love so I feel like you can see that too in a way you know what I mean the way that you create and direct is inherently vulnerable like I my experience would be different because I like to create worlds that are like not my own like they're not about like me capturing my relationship yeah whereas yours is or at least was at the time like so it was like raw kind of yeah yeah Yeah. okay well speaking of making art with exes. How's your experience been creating music and like drawing lines between what you think is like appropriate or inappropriate or especially now because you're in a relationship Mm -hmm. and then you're creating art. Are you writing songs like about your partner? Are you writing songs about exes? Like do you think that there's like a... Yeah. How do you balance that? It's interesting. Well now I'm dating someone who's in the music music, industry. Um, I'm dating someone who's a producer and, and an engineer. So also someone who I'm like on opposite ends with. What I love about my girlfriend, she's like explicitly said to me like, listen go write. Like, know that you can, like, go write. I don't want you to think about me listening to it. I feel that's a unique experience. Really? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) yeah. Just (laughs) as someone who's been close enough to the industry, I feel not all partners are that chill about it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Someone telling you you can be filterless is different than taking a filter off. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? It's like you have the permission from her Yeah. But you have to give it to yourself, too. Yes. And that's much harder, I feel. She's not the first girlfriend I've written songs about, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I've written so many songs about other exes, and not everyone takes it super well. (laughs) Which is 
of course, understand understandable. I mean, I do think that there are boundaries in not necessarily what you are allowed to share, but like what what is like necessary mm-hmm. to be honest and like what is unnecessary. You're in a unique situation because your relationships have been really public mm-hmm. and mine haven't. Well, even your relationships that are public, I think that I just set a precedent mm-hmm. with my first relationship that made people feel just like inherently more invested in all my relationships there right. on out. You are a musician. A lot of people are following you predominantly for your music, predominantly for your personality, whatever. You and your girlfriend post probably as much as I kind of posted with my ex-girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And we probably posted a little bit more, but the investment that people make into the relationship is different. Yeah. Do you know? Definitely. I mean, this is the only like public relationship I've ever been in. Mm-hmm. I've never posted about exes and that's... That's either been because I wasn't out Mm -hmm. or because I was dating someone who also had a following and they were like, let's not do this. Yeah. Or we both were like, let's not do this because that's... It's a lot. A lot. (laughs) Hey, it's a lot. (laughs) Everyone wants to be authentic with the people that they're sharing with, but there, there are things that you, once they're out, you can never take back that part of your life. It's weird because our, like socials and I've always felt this because I mean I started doing this when I was so young so Mm -hmm. I've like never really had just like an Instagram ever now to myself or a Twitter like it's always I've always known people were listening to some degree and in intertwining your relationship with your work at all is scary so scary yeah and I never want her to feel like she is either being used or being pressured to be a part of anything or anything other than just like my baby. <laughs> <laughs> you are my baby. Yes. Well, I think you do an amazing job of balancing that, of Thanks. like showing and then also keeping things precious. I mean, it's it's such a weird line. It's, and there's no rule. There's there no and there's no, no like line. <laughs> yeah. Even as time has gone on, we don't know the long lasting effects of what we share and don't share until years later Mm -hmm. I'm still feeling it and as far as like the artistic side of things everyone has a right to obviously I mean music is like the most like honest expression of ourselves at the same time like when you know that your relationship is an interesting part of yourself and your identity that people care about like I do think that there there's a difference in in what I do versus what another artist might do um, and why they would want to make the decisions that they make. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I, I'd be out here questioning a lot of things. <laughs> but, Same. but at the end of the day, there's just, I'm always thinking about how someone is going to he- receive what mm-hmm. I do. And to act like that isn't a part of what I'm doing, whether they're going to be affected by it publicly or not. Mm-hmm. Like, you're just always thinking yeah. about someone else reading your words or listening to what you're saying. Total. I mean, um, I just think artists do have at least a little responsibility to think about the aftermath of the music that they create. Whether or yeah. not that means filtering yourself or just taking responsibility that like something that you may or may not say will yes. or could hurt someone or make someone sad or yes. like whatever it is. That's real. Things that you say in general, as people, if you're saying it publicly, will affect whoever's on the receiving end of that, you know? Of course. And you have to be mindful, I feel, of that. I think for me, the thing that was so interesting about dating an artist is from the beginning of dating an artist was like, I know that my life is up for grabs. Like, I know that my like, like my likeness is up for grabs. There will be things written about me or could be written about me. I think for me, there were things that got talked about that I thought crossed a line that I didn't Mm -hmm. necessarily sign up for. Yeah. And that has been, that has been like the hardest thing to swallow because anything else, anything and everything else I was ready for. And it's like, of course, the universe throws you something. You're like, okay, I didn't actually prepare for that. Yeah. You're mixing your work and your career with your personal life. Mm -hmm. And like, I just, there's so much risk in that, but it's impossible to avoid when your career is revolved around being honest and vulnerable about your life. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's a weighted decision 
to make. And no, I really don't think it's a black and white thing. It's all fucking loaded. It's like, loaded. It's I intense. don't think we're going to solve <laughs> this issue today. No, but, but it, we have experienced it on the on opposite different sides. Ends. Yeah. yeah, different different sides. How do you feel like you found your look and vibe and like everything with your artist project? Because mm. it does feel like it's very its own world. How did you like land on the dazzled chainsaws <laughs> and huge fake titties that you lost? Um, I know. To Australia. Uh, oh my god. For the people who aren't familiar mm-hmm. with like my visuals and my music, it's become it's become really important to me to make the things that I've always wanted to make. And I've been lucky to work with people who have brought that out of me and also are like as unafraid to go there as I am. I think that it's been important to, and this is something I've learned from a lot of people I've worked with, is to have things that can connect to my music that aren't just myself. Mm -hmm. They're like an actual physical world. Mm -hmm. And things like the chainsaw are like inspired by the bits of glamour that I'm inspired by, the bits of camp or the bits of like absurdity or something that feels like, I feel like that's something within pop music that you have just the world as your oyster. It's like free reign. Yes. And as long as you commit to something, like, anything goes. So true. <laughs> and you can be as absurd as you want to be, and, like, that is what, like, makes the best pop the best pop, is mm-hmm. when it's fucking nuts. But in a way, does it kind of make you feel safe? Because it's not exactly Rebecca Black, but mm-hmm. it is, like, Rebecca Black. Like, there is, like, me who, like, shows up today mm-hmm. and talks and has my world and has my friends and mm-hmm. everything. And... The side that is Rebecca Black is, like, all of the shit that lives in my head that, like, I just don't need to express every day. Yeah. It's, like, my It's, like, is it almost like an world. alter ego, or do you feel like it is just you, but, like, it's what both. you don't talk about? It's both. I mean, I have this experience. I'm, like, carried out by two people when I enter my show Mm -hmm. and I have this experience I don't know how to explain it where like as soon as like I get picked up and I'm over this man's shoulder (laughs) my dancer's (laughs) shoulder I can like unlock a side of myself that like just does not exist yeah outside of it or same thing if I'm like on set for a a video or planning anything taking a photo I don't know it's just it is a little bit of an alter ego I think but it is really like probably the truest version of myself yeah like the most unafraid version of myself I think you've always had that part of you that turns on it's you but it's hyper it's more Mm -hmm. more you Mm -hmm. almost so watching you do that and then what you've done with Friday and like the performances you do with it now it's crazy a level of nostalgia but also it's a brand new song a brand new Rebecca Black totally you met me at like such a weird point in my life because as a kid I was like so expressive and so creative and so on every stage that I could that I could get on because performing was just like where I found like my life yeah that was my source of inspiration and identity and happiness and like purpose after my experience with Friday all of that individuality that was like just starting to cultivate as a kid Mm -hmm. left my body Mm -hmm. and I was so shut down and like had no idea who I was I had no sense of self that was like my biggest crux in therapy and as a teenager and an early 20 year old I was so reliant on what other people wanted for me because I had totally lost all trust in myself. Mm -hmm. My queerness was the first thing that I owned, like actually like, not like owned, but like (laughs) I like actually had possession of in my life that was just mine and Mm -hmm. no one else's. And that was like the starting bread for everything else that I've created in my life. So beautiful. (laughs) <laughs> it like actually is though. Catapulted you back into into my yourself, body, <laughs> into you. It's like it did. Now I have the control again. I know who I am, and it's like a different. It's not something yeah. the internet told me that I am. It's I'm doing it like all myself. Yes. Kind of got like the craziest form of rejection therapy anyone ever got <laughs> in yeah. the world. You could have gone two ways. It could have like completely shut you down forever, or it could be like okay, I can do anything. I could be definitely. Anyone. I, and it kind of did both. <laughs> True. I mean, it's something that I am still on a journey of now, but I definitely, I look back to who I was like six or seven years ago and I'm just so, I don't, I, like it feels like a different 
a more different version of my life than like my life when I was a kid. Yeah. Like before any of it happened. And I'm just grateful that like I'm here now because I am so much happier and less bogged down by the idea of life. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, fair. I'm so proud of you. The way that you've like owned things and just like blossomed and grown into the coolest person ever. And you're like a fully actualized human being. Even when I met you, I feel there was so much hesitancy and not self-assuredness that I feel so different today. Oh, thanks. Okay, we're going to answer questions that people sent me on Instagram. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's at Now This Is Living, and you could ask me a question in the future. What's your Instagram? Rebecca Black? Ms. Rebecca Black. Follow Rebecca, too, while you're at it. Thank you. The first time having sex with a girl, what on earth do I do? So so true. So true. So true. No one knows. No one one knows. (laughs) Hmm. I mean, I'm presuming it's a girl that has the person she's having sex with has had sex already. That's kind of what I was thinking too. Because if you're both flying blind, it's actually in some ways maybe better. better. Way better. Oh, I can just say as like having my first hookups with girls as a previously straight girl. And they had had, yeah. And I'm hooking up with gay girls. Like girls who had had like long-term Professionally gay girls. Professionally gay. (laughs) Yeah. I was like not allowed to, I was given limits. Really? Because I was not trusted. Because I was straight. Yes. I hate that. People oh, yeah. not straight. And I know I'm not the only one. Yeah, that definitely happens. Um, try, what is the advice that I could give? I mean, just try to be as easy on yourself as you can. And sex is the most fun and freeing, like, when you can laugh. Yeah. And when you can... I agree. I cannot... I've never had sex and not laughed at some point. Like, yeah. It has to, there has to be a lightness to it. Yes. And the vulnerability has to be there. And I'm hoping that whoever is having sex with someone for the first time, at least there's some trust there. Totally. Also, it doesn't matter if you've never had sex with a girl or a guy or anything before. The first time having sex with anyone at all is intimidating. It's always intimidating. Yeah. It doesn't matter who it is. Always. And that experience in itself, like, is not different just because you're having sex with them for the first time at all or having sex with someone of that gender for the first time but I mean it's never going to be perfect it's going to be awkward it's going to be weird and there's always more times to try hopefully (laughs) hopefully (laughs) yeah I think being honest that it is your first time maybe could be helpful I don't know how vulnerable you I'm a very vulnerable person just naturally like if I'm sleeping with someone I will immediately be like I've never done this before Oh, or, that's not me, unfortunately. That makes sense. <laughs> to me, it's like the only way to be. Yeah. Like, it makes me feel more confident. But I feel like some people are like, fake it till you make it. But communicating yeah. in whatever way that is. Whatever makes you feel more confident, do that. So that you don't feel so yeah. much pressure. Also, there's like not that much. It's, it's not. It's, I was going to say it's not that hard. But I'm like, it kind of <laughs> is hard sometimes. It is hard. I mean, it's inherently uncomfortable. Because it's so intimate and vulnerable it's the definition of intimacy so I think for me I get this pressure of like well I now have to turn into like the sexiest hottest most confident girl Mm -hmm. this person has ever seen yeah and that's not the truth I could learn so much by like being honest chances are the other person is feeling just as much as you are yeah I think that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves in sex to think that like the end goal is to finish true and I think going into sex for the first time, if you've never done it before, taking some of that pressure off, there's a chance you won't make someone finish. But like sex is not about like an end goal. It's like the whole experience is fun. It should be fun. You shouldn't be like, if I don't make you come, this isn't fun. And the first time is all about like getting to know someone's body and like understand what they like and understand who they are. Totally. And the more open that you can be to each other, like the better sex that you will have. Agreed. In the future. Agreed. But it's scary. It's scary. We we feel for you if you haven't had sex with a girl and you're about to. But it's going to be so fun. It's going to be worth it. Yeah. How do you maintain a good balance of who you are in the relationship and who you are outside of it? Ooh. I feel like that's something a lot of queer women struggle with sometimes because we have that friend group situation that can happen so easily where you're kind of Mm. almost always an extension of your partner right do you know what I mean because you like hang out with a lot of same people maybe it's a me thing it definitely is a me thing but I've definitely lost like my identity within relationships before as like a person like a solo person totally I mean it's it's hard I mean when you're 
we're talking so much about intimacy, but when you find a person that you really connect with, it feels almost natural that you would kind of blend into one person. You like assimilate. Yeah. And it's someone that becomes your best friend and you want to spend the most amount of time within the world. And so it's obviously easier to hang out with them sometimes than your own friends. So true. Because you know this person understands you and trusts you. There's nothing quite like queer girl relationships. You get to bring your partner kind of everywhere. Straight couples have like girls nights and exactly. boys nights. Exactly. We don't have that. Yeah. You can have a girls night with your girlfriend. With your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm coming and so is yeah, my girlfriend. Yeah. But yeah, I think just having boundaries on time and like the importance of having mm. friendships outside of your partner Yeah, will help create your own identity totally. and your own like things that are not y'all's thing going back to an ex yay or nay i've done it proceed with caution (laughs) yeah know that if you were heartbreaking once before it can happen again it can happen again and sometimes it's worse the second time sometimes it's worse the second time in my experience when i did it it actually provided closure the second time Mm -hmm. at least for me i can only speak for me i'm not sure it provided that much closure (laughs) for me (laughs) the second third fourth fifth time (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I think it's, you can, there's like, you can't say yay or nay because the heart wants what it wants. And like, sometimes it it's just going to happen. Is it the best decision always? Probably mm-hmm. not. But sometimes maybe. If you're doing it because you can't get over the person and maybe it's only been a couple months or a couple weeks or something like that. Like if it's something that you're doing to escape the discomfort mm-hmm. of getting over someone, maybe not a good idea. But so true. If you feel like you've both taken some time to maybe change the things that weren't working, maybe then worth discovering. So often I feel like we're just trying to escape the discomfort of breakups, which Mm -hmm. are painful. So Take it from me. Horrible. Horrible vibes. How to feel confident with someone going down on you. I put this in because I actually have had many conversations with like queer friends of mine who have like holdups on someone going down on them. Really? Have like... Not that much confidence, I feel, in their body. Yes. I feel like as women, we just feel so judged and we feel we Mm -hmm. compare ourselves to other women so much. And I feel like some women, like for the first time hooking up with a girl, they're looking at your body and comparing Mm -hmm. their body to Mm -hmm. your body. It's like, I wish the comparison of women to women could disappear within a woman loving relationship but totally oh my gosh I mean that's a whole other conversation yeah I do think there is like a difference in straight culture of like how we are supposed to take care of our bodies in order to make things easier for the other person Mm -hmm. there is just a lot in general about sex and the experience of going down on someone or oral Mm -hmm. that like yeah is simply about for women like making your body easier to experience for men whether it's shaving whether it's tastes and smells and like what's so insane is that it's about pleasuring you You. I think there's so many dangerous like mechanisms and tips and things that people try to do to make themselves be more digestible <laughs> pun, pun intended. Uh, yeah, and I'm just, uh, I, I think it's so unfortunate because you should be treating your body in the way that you want to treat it. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're doing with it should hopefully be done because it makes you feel sexy totally. and not will hopefully make another person think that you're sexy. You have to believe that whoever you're hooking up with is, like, wanting to be there and present with you. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just going to drive yourself crazy. Yeah, and if if they are not, like, that is truly the other person's own problem mm-hmm. and mistake. Not something you need to own. It's none of your business. No. Yeah. You know what's been so fun for me that has honestly really changed my relationship with, like, bodies and women's bodies and comparing myself? Um, I love the Korean spa. <laughs> yeah. I actually have my girlfriend to thank for this one because mm-hmm. she was the first person to, to bring me to one of those and I used to be one of those people that was like I would never go to a nude spa and just pounce around with my body now I feel like I can't go because I'm talking about the fact that I go to great yeah. spas but um, I think there is something so awesomely desensitizing around being around just like other real women's bodies totally and this fear of like presenting yourself as a naked person to somebody else for the first time becomes so much easier when you realize like we're all so different. Everything is we're so, all so different. 
and we're also beautiful. Yes. There's so much comparison. There's so much comparison. Yes. And oh, it's yeah. like, so it just, who is it serving at the end of the day? Not you. I, it's, it's only making yourself and your body more uncomfortable to you. And that, mm. I speak as someone who like, ugh, I've had crazy relationships with my body and body dysmorphia and like all of that shit. And as I've tried to release some of that, as I've gotten older, I have become happier. You deserve to enjoy yourself in every shape. Totally. Anyway. It's weird for me because I'm so not attracted to myself. Mm, I am like totally completely the opposite of my type. Seeing myself naked for a long time didn't instill confidence in me. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm like, yeah. this isn't what I like to look at exactly. Yeah. I think just as I've gotten older, I'm like realizing I'm not supposed to necessarily be, be your, attracted be to your myself. Own type. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've definitely had a lot of that with especially in like my queer relationships where I've really been with someone who like loves me and my body mm -hmm. and specifically my body. And it was so hard for me to believe. Accepting the compliment versus being like, oh no, like yeah. that's something I've had to teach myself how to do because so for so long I'd be like, okay, yeah, whatever. Well, like, we're not taught to. No. Like we're not taught to learn how to accept compliments. We're learned to deflect. And yeah. Learn to and be like, be, okay, whatever. Like yeah. you're lying to me. Yeah. Great question. Great question. And also let people go down on you if you want them to. And True. feel good about yourself. True. It's True. fun. And if they don't want to be there, kick them out. Yeah, for real. If your partner is more experienced in bed, how do you overcome the insecurity of not meeting their standards? Which is... Oh my gosh. I also was less experienced in my first yeah. real like queer relationship. And it definitely affected me a lot. I remember... Really? Yes. I remember being like, have you done this? And she'd be like, yeah. And be like, have you done this? And she'd be like, yeah. And I like got to this point where I'm like, oh my gosh, what have you not done? And I hadn't done any of the stuff that I'd be like, have you used this kind of toy? Or have you done yeah. that? And I let that get in my head so much when it could have been like such a fun experience to be like, okay, you know things I don't know. Like, show me yeah, or teach whatever. Me. Like, what, what can we do? Yes. And also, I regret that so much that I let really? that get in my head. I mean, it... It's understandable why it would get in your head as someone who's young and inexperienced. And like, I was the queen, especially when I was a teenager. I was literally like, get this virginity off my body. <laughs> like, get this. I literally just don't, I just don't want to be the most inexperienced person. But one thing I've learned, just because you've had a lot of sex doesn't mean you're good at it. <laughs> I definitely had a version of that insecurity when I was like a coming into my own queerness and having sex with lesbians mm -hmm. as a discovering girl. <laughs> um, and looking back, like I definitely had boundaries placed upon me, like mm -hmm. as a girl who was not to be trusted with someone else's vag. Uh, I hate <laughs> that that happened to you. That I look back and I'm just like, well, that's your loss, girl. Yeah, like, totally. I, <laughs> you totally. know, what do you think about staying friends with exes? Hmm. Personally, fine. I think that it's hard. It is hard. I think it's hard also when other partners come into the mix, mm -hmm. whether it's your partner or your ex's partner. It's it's just mm -hmm. really hard to be. I think it's hard to be extremely respectful totally no matter what especially if you've had like a long-term relationship with someone I think maybe if you like dated someone casually for a bit a lot yeah. easier but it's a kind of a case-by-case -case situation definitely. I definitely 1000% think that there is always a necessary period of no contact I agree in order to reestablish yourself and your life and untwine all of those things that made you guys a relationship. I've tried to jump into immediately being friends with an ex after breaking up and that is just never going to work. Yeah. You know, there's just so there's much. just too many feelings. So many feelings and you're changing the way, you're changing your boundaries with someone totally. and that takes time. I think in an ideal world, I would be friends with all my exes. Mm -hmm. In a real world, I'm not. Yeah. That's real. Yeah. That's real. Masturbation, healthy or harmful to your relationship? Healthy! healthy. Go! get in there get, get in there <laughs> not only is it important for like relationship sustainability because yeah. girl you're gonna be on everyone's on different modes different methods different zones it's just like it's, different zones. it's just your desire is an important thing to be in touch with regardless totally also for me masturbation sometimes like feels like 
taking a nap. <laughs> like, like, it's not like this fucking hot, amazing situation. It's honestly like self care. It's like it's very self care. Doing a too. doing a face mask. I'm like I gotta really quickly get this done. For <laughs> it's so true. I need like a boost of serotonin. Yes, and I'm moving on. Yes. And yes. we should all be aiming to make our days better. Yeah. Okay, what's your attachment style? And how has that affected your relationship? So avoidant. So avoidant. Actually, on my first date with my girlfriend, we somehow got in like a really intense conversation about the both attachment. being pretty avoidant. Do you feel that you both have remained avoidant, like deeper into your relationship? Or because in my experience, no. I'm um I'm disorganized attachment style. So like I, sometimes I'm avoidant sometimes i'm anxious sometimes i'm oh, secure I've never heard of that. so it's like oh, you wow. kind of can become all three of them mm-hmm. and i find that in most of my relationships i've gone the opposite of whatever the other person is i think that it's affected my relationships in different ways based on like the healthiness of the relationship mm-hmm. and also being at like a different point in my life and my journey with my ex like I was avoidant and I stayed avoidant yeah. <laughs> and I, I wasn't in the right relationship, Yeah, you know, and that was the problem. So I used my attachment style as kind of a method to almost, probably self-sabotage yeah. it. Um, whereas now we know our misgivings and we're open about it and we actively try to work on like making our communication better because we love each other yeah. and want to be together. Yeah. And we've, we, we've gotten in fights. Like we've gotten in fights where we've let it get the best of us, but being on the end of those. And now I think getting to the next level of our relationship, it's just not worth it. Like Mm-mm. the fight isn't the most interesting part of our relationship. No. And I think that was maybe sabotaging me before the most passionate I felt about my relationship was when I would let myself be like avoidant or Mm -hmm. let myself kind of ruin it and in this one like I just don't enjoy that feeling at all like I want my girlfriend to be happy yeah because you want it to work and I want to be happy yeah the difference so we just put in the work it makes those conversations way easier so much better yeah did we crush this I hope so. I hope so, too. I had fun. This was amazing. I had a great time. I feel like we're literally 2017 making a YouTube video. (laughs) Do you have anything coming up that you want to tell the people about? Just stream the album. I put out my debut album this year, Let It Burn, and I'm working on the new one. So listen to that. Thank you for listening to this episode of X's and O's. Check out Rebecca on all her socials. Follow me on my socials. If you're watching this on YouTube, hey. If you're listening on some other platform, Hey. Thank you. And subscribe to X's and O's wherever you (laughs) listen to your podcast. Do it.